fun. So it's a great learning experience at a very early age. And I might have stayed and made a career with them, but I was offered a position uh, in Seattle and, and uh, went to work for the Hertz Corporation as a manager at the Seattle airport. I had, um, had the opportunity to work in both customer service and in the management of the operations. And what I learned there is that a car is a car is a car. So whether it's from Avis National, Budget, or Hertz, the product is basically the same. But it's the experience that keeps customers coming back. And so Hertz worked very, very hard at that customer experience and wanted to maintain their status as number one. I came back to Florida as a regional trainer and spent five years uh, going up and down the East Coast training managers and rental agents in the customer experience and wowing them. One day, I sat next uh, to a gentleman by the name of Philip Crosby as I was on a plane to our headquarters in New York City, and he told me he was the author of a book called Quality is Free. And what I had learned in all those economic classes in college is that quality wasn't free, that it cost you a lot of money, and so your job in management was to determine the optimum level, the point of equilibrium where too much quality costs you too much money and make that decision. As I explained this thought process to him, he started to smile and he said, well, they're wrong. He says it's the lack of quality that costs you money because every time you don't do it right the first time, you have to go back and do it all over again. Would you like to come work with me? So for 10 years, I worked with Phil Crosby at the Quality College. And what I learned there is that it truly does take a culture. It's a mindset and that quality has to be first amongst everything because it doesn't matter how nice I smile or how good of eye contact I give someone if I don't deliver on my promise. He sold the company. I went back to Disney and spent another uh, decade with uh, the Disney Institute as a speaker sharing Disney programs uh, to outside organizations. And it's from this experience and combination of the Hertz, the Disney, and the Philip Crosby Associates that I'd like to share with you today these strategies of the experience that we give our students in higher education. But before we do, I'd like to ask you, so as I share some of my experiences, um, and how many of you can relate to the uh, Walt Disney World theme parks, any one of them, whether it's Japan or California or Orlando, um, have you ever been to a Disney park? Yes. Yeah. I'm not seeing a poll here. So let me move on then. And as you think about um, if you've ever been as a uh, guest into one of their parks, when you think about what do you remember the most, Think about that first time you went. What was the first impression that was most memorable? And many of their guests will say that it was clean, friendly, and fun. In fact, that's the top three responses, is that it's clean, friendly, and fun. And that's not about the rides. And when you think about it, they've got some $100 million rides there, but what people remember the most is the experience, the clean, friendly, and fun. So let's take a look at why then, as we look at the experience that your students have with you at your college or university, why is that experience so important? Well, four main reasons that I'd like to cover today is service excellence is important to an educational institution because as students today, they have so many choices from your public universities, your private universities, your community colleges, online, and only a little over 50% of the students that you enroll today will actually cross the finish line in six years from now. And that gets expensive as you are constantly then having to bring on new students to cover for those that you work so hard 
to uh, market to, to advertise, and, and to enroll. It's creating a foundation of excellent service in your culture because culture is what your college is known for. Culture is what drives day-to-day -day behavior. What do employees do when you're not looking? And it goes back to what are those cultural norms? The third thing I'd like to cover is what are those elements that create a ideal service experience? What are those things that your students and other customers will remember about the experience they had with your institution? And then finally, we'll take a look at what are the ways to build service culture into the image and the brand for your institution. So why does retention matter? Well, there's several reasons. There's the social, moral, and ethical reasons that you do work hard to market and advertise and bring students in. And they're giving up, though, a time in their life that they're never going to get back. And we've made promises to them. We've made promises to them that we're going to help give them the knowledge that they need to get a job out into the job market, that we can help them to become productive citizens in our communities, leaders of tomorrow in our communities in the world. So we've made promises to them. It's our prestige image and brand that's at stake here. Everybody wants to go to the Cheers University. Everybody wants to be proud to say, here's where I graduated from or here's where I go. They want to wear with pride the sweatshirt that has that logo of your institution on it. And when they talk to their friends, they want to feel that pride that they feel good about where they are. And then finally, there's that financial viability that it costs around $5,460 to obtain a new student and process that new student. And when we lose that student, now we've got to go back and do it all over again. So it also has a factor on community support because you get more support from your alumni and your donors and the community itself when they see that you are producing these students that can graduate and go out into the world. So let's take a look, though, at the academic factors and what's important to retention. You would think that the academic factors of those who are going to be most successful in their grade point averages would be those students who would stay and graduate. But as you look at this, the ACT assessment scores and the high school GPA, they are very strong indicators for success academically. However, when you look at what are those factors that are strongest for retention, those SAT test, ACT test scores, that high school GPA, it slips further up the chain. And what becomes more strong indicators of retention are do the students have the study skills? Do they have the academic self-confidence? Do they have academic goals? Are they satisfied with their school choice? Do they feel they're getting the social support? So conventional wisdom shows that it's more the experience, it's more the service factors that are going to keep your students to make them successful. Why do students leave a school? Well, according to research, those feelings of indifference. I was just another tuition. I was just one more person uh, that they were accepting a check from, 30%. Staff and faculty lack of concern that perhaps I had a problem. I tried to get someone to listen to it. Maybe they did listen to it, but from my perception, they didn't feel as it was as strong a concern as I felt they should have. Or finally, just unhappy. Just, I don't feel like I fit in here. Um, I don't know why I came here because I don't feel like I, I can fit in socially or comfortably um, or even academically in with everyone else. So a total of 72% are more service related, which means those institutions that take a look at the service and the experience have a huge opportunity to make an impact 
in increasing graduation rates and increasing retention. So once again, um, I just want to um, remind everybody that what we're talking about is the experience that surrounds your product. And what is your product? Your product is the learning in the classroom. We're not, when we talk about service excellence, when I look at it from the perspective that I share with my clients is that it's not the content that the instructor, that the faculty member is teaching that history class, that English class, it's not touching that product at all. What it is looking at though is how easy did you help me get through the registration process? Um, how uh, were you there to, uh, when you said that you would have advising counseling sessions and you posted your office hours with an advisor available? Uh, did you help me when I needed uh, some help perhaps in getting through some of the maze of the processes that we have, whether it's through scheduling or the uh, residential life? So it's the experience that we're looking at. And education leaders recognize that the student experience is the competitive battleground, that it is the opportunity where you have to differentiate yourself from other institutions. But to me, it's got to be enculturated. And enculturated is not a real word. Uh, I just made it up, so don't go looking it up in the dictionary. But to me, what it means is it just becomes a part of how we do things, that you don't even think about it, that it's just ingrained. And remember I said that I had started working at Walt Disney World when I was 17 years old, and remember um, that the top three things the guests remember the most is that it's clean, friendly, and fun from their experience. Well, how do you think that they keep it so clean? They do have custodial hosts and hostesses, but the real way that it's kept so clean is that everybody has to pick up trash. Now recognizing that I was 17 um, and what did my room look like, um, probably looks like, looked like a lot of other teenagers' rooms, but I was told on the very first day of orientation that not only did I have my job, but I also had to pick up trash. And so I started to pick up trash and pick up trash and until today, um, I don't even think about it, uh, walking through a shopping mall or, or any kind of uh, rooms where I see the trash. It's become ingrained, and that's what enculturating is, is that it's, it's just a understanding that you only have those few opportunities to touch a student, and that every touch point, we have to be delivering that excellent service. And it starts with identifying then, what is your higher purpose? What is the reason why you've taken a job at the school you're working at? What is it that you truly are delivering to your students and other customers? And I use that word customer because your students, they are buying a service and a product, product being that degree, the services being the learning that takes place. And so, but you also have other customers as well. You have vendors, you have visitors onto your campus, you have board members, you have taxpayers. So all of those are those people that you interact with. And when you think about what is your true product, what is it that you truly are looking to sell, it's really the foundation for service excellence. Let me share with you um, what is meant by service philosophy, because this is what gives a common vision, a opportunity for every employee working within your institution to know exactly what is the emotional connection that we want to create with our students and customers, because it's that emotional connection that will keep them coming back when they feel that you care about them. So that service philosophy gives a very clear image of how do we treat people, how do we treat each other. It creates that emotional connection, that feeling that builds the relationship. Because when a student accepts, is accepted at your institution, 
it, it's like they become engaged to you. They get excited about you, and they get passionate about you, and they want those same feelings felt back in return to them, that they too were chosen, and that, they, that you are exci as excited about them as they are about you. So it is a feeling. And a servant's philosophy also provides a foundation for decision making. Is this in alignment with what we believe? And at Walt Disney, um, they have made this very clear to all their cast members that the emotional connection that they want to create, that higher purpose, no matter what job task you're hired for, custodian, gift shop clerk, monorail train driver, but your real purpose every day when you come into your shift is really to create happiness. That's what you're there for. That's their true product. And so they've written it in a very short, simple statement. It's not a mission statement. It's not a value statement. It's not four paragraphs long. It's very, very simply, we create happiness by providing the finest and entertainment for people of all ages everywhere. And frankly, they don't care if every cast member remembers that entire statement. What they want is for every cast member, though, to remember the first three words. What do we do? What are you here for? You're here to create happiness. And that becomes very, very powerful in terms of a mindset that no longer is it then that you are just doing that job task, but now you're looking for opportunities to create happiness. And they also put processes in place to help that. So for example, if it's your birthday, they'll give you a birthday pin. So now all throughout the day, every cast member, is, when they see that pin, it's going to be wishing you a happy birthday. And that is a way to create happiness. Uh, on the uh, employee badges, the cast member badges, they'll put a hometown of where you came from. I was from Birmingham, Alabama. And so when a guest would see that, or I would see that they had a, a, maybe a Auburn University or University of Alabama sweatshirt on or any other indicator, um, I was able then to carry on a conversation and, and build a relationship and create that happiness. So it's looking for ways once you determine what is that uh, true purpose that you have. And I thought I would share with you because recognizing you're not a theme park um, and you don't have characters. Um, what are some of the clients uh, and educational institutions that I've worked with, what, what have been some of their service philosophies uh, in terms of their higher purpose? So here's one. Um, we change lives. How? By empowering, inspiring, and educating our students and community. Think about it. We change lives. That's what we do. So now everybody from the uh, en enrollment to registration to IT the custodians, everybody comes in to their job on that campus recognizing I have the opportunity to change someone's life today. Another one, we inspire confidence through every interaction to empower lives and build futures by providing a caring learning environment. So now everyone is looking to inspire confidence in every interaction because they recognize they are impacting people's lives, people's futures. And, and so this is the foundation. And it's got to be internally as well as externally because there is a domino effect. If I come in in the morning and my coworker uh, says something rude, sarcastic, or cynical to me, um, it's pretty hard for me, is it not, to now interact and deal with that student that's standing in front of my desk with a question or that parent or that visitor or other person who's looking for information or for me to do my job, it becomes very difficult then to put on that mask of a happy face or a helpful face. So there has to be a recognition of how we treat each other internally from department to department. That when another department calls and has information um, that they need from us, and it's like, oh no, it's you again but that we're helping each other, recognizing that to that student or other customer, we are representing our entire institution. That they don't think about us as departments. They don't think of us in silos. 
they think of us as a whole, and that becomes their impression of us. So this service philosophy, we change lives, or we inspire confidence, or we enrich lives, uh, we build trust, uh, whatever your higher purpose becomes, it has to apply internally as well as externally. The second component then are what are those standards of behavior that if every employee exhibited these behaviors, they would be able to deliver that service philosophy, that higher purpose every time. And so these service standards, they give criteria for making service decisions, that if I have to make a choice, what do I do? They give a tool now to management and to each employee for their own self-measurement. Did I do that behavior in that interaction? And this is what helps add that consistency across the organization. Because with these service standards that Disney has, you don't go into the Magic Kingdom and say, wow, those people are really, really nice that work at the Magic Kingdom, but don't go to Epcot um, because they don't act in that way. You get a seamlessness across all the different theme parks. The same way you can get a seamlessness from every department that you have and all the different campuses that you may have as well that represent your university or college. So here I thought I'd share with you um, Disney standards and, and then we can start to think about what might be your standards. So for them, their service standards are show, safety, efficiency, and courtesy. The show is important because that's why you, you go to Disney is for the show. That uh, you want to be immersed in the fantasy land or the frontier land. Um, and it's become a part with the smells and the sights and the sounds of the different uh, areas. Safety is very, very important to them because that is going to ruin your vacation if somebody gets hurt. So they're always watching out for your safety. Efficiency is very important because if you feel like you're wasting too much time waiting in line or they're not being very efficient, you may choose to go to another vacation destination uh, next time. And then finally, courteous. Being uh, very friendly, being treated with respect is always a hallmark of the Disney organization. So these are their four service standards. And because they wanted every cast member to be empowered, recognizing that once again, it's the culture that drives the behavior, they prioritized these service standards as to we want everyone to do all four of these all the time. But if you have to choose, if you're in a situation and you have to choose one over the other, what would you choose first, second, and third? So I believe we do have the audience poll here. And uh, so if I could, I'd like to ask you, which of the four service standards is number one in priority, do you think, to the Disney cast members? Number four. Do you guys think number four? Number four. I'm going out and saying same. That's a good point. Safety being number All right, one. looks like we've got 62% uh, uh, for safety and 32% for courtesy. All right, let's go on to the next poll question then. Uh, in terms of which of the four service standards is number two in priority? And I'm going to tell you safety is number one. So safety is number one, so what do you think is number two? Courtesy. 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 Yeah. Unless you have a hold on your hand. <laughs> I will tell you we're all listening very closely when I said the top three reasons were clean, friendly, and fun. So definitely courtesy is number two because 
that's what guests take away from the experience is how friendly they were. All right, let's go for the uh, third one. Which of the four service uh, standards is number three in priority? Efficiency. Your service philosophy. 
And once you have those, it's then laying it throughout the entire service experience. That this is the experience that the student or the customer has with you. And there are four critical factors that affect it. In the middle, we have that student or that customer. Who is that student? Who is that customer you're interacting with? The second is the service environment. It's everything that that student or customer sees, hears, smells, touches. If you've ever been into a restaurant with your family and you saw something or smelled something and said, oh, we're not going to eat there, and you walked out, then that was the service environment that impacted your experience. Might have had very friendly waiters and waitresses, but it was the environment that affected it. And then we have the service delivery. This is the people part of this. This is the little things that you do where the student or other customer says, wow. It could be uh, your helpfulness. It could be your courteousness. It could be taking that extra little step uh, and, and showing them if they're lost, how to get to a building. It could be your voice tone, the facial expressions. Do you look happy to see them or do you look annoyed to see them? And then you have your processes. Your processes impact, greatly impact the experience. Many times students get so frustrated by the processes that they have to go through that by the time that they actually get to the person that can help them, they are so frustrated or so disappointed or so angry or so upset. Um, it can be how many clicks did I have to go through on your website to be able to get scheduled into a class. Uh, it could be reaching uh, the right person to talk to. Have any of you ever tried calling yourself without knowing your extension? Can, can you get to uh, your right uh, phone extension? So little things, but they add up. So let's take a look. And in terms of a service experience, there's some language here that will help as many uh, employees start to use this terminology, it begins to build this culture of service excellence. So the first is, whose lens are we looking through in designing our processes? Whose lens are we looking through when we uh, set up these procedures? Do we look through the lens of the student, or are we looking through uh, our lens of ourselves? So, uh, for example, you know, when you uh, call IT and the student uh, has an issue, uh, is it easy for them to be able to get a response back? Um, we say that we look through the lens of our students and customers, but many times we don't. Um, take a look at your ad drop process. How many signatures did I have to go through? How difficult or easy was it to be able to locate who I needed to be able to add uh, that class or drop that class? Um, that maybe your offices are closed during lunch and that's the only time as a student that I'm able to be able to do uh, or handle my administrative or financial concerns or questions. Um, getting tickets to uh, sporting events. So it's looking through their lens in terms of identifying where are their emotions and what are their needs, and truly putting yourself into their shoes. I remember as a, a frontline cast member, I would have a guest um, as I would be walking around in the area uh, where I worked, uh, come up to me sometimes and say, you know, what time is the three o'clock parade? And as I would think to myself, well, surely, if you truly thought about the question you just asked, it seems rather silly. But when you look at it through their lens, they're probably trying to decide, well, where do I need to be to see the entire parade from start to finish? And so as you look through their lens, it changes the perspective and it changes how you're going to respond uh, to that guest. So looking through the lens of your students, identifying with their emotions, and then meeting their needs. And the second element then, the terminology here is everything speaks. Everything speaks in your service environment. It's sending a message. Is it the message you wanted to send? 
if you have taped up signs with that scotch tape that's still up of these events uh, that occurred three or four months ago, uh, if you have overflowing dumpsters, uh, fingerprints on glass doors and windows, signage that uh, is confusing, arrows pointing every which direction. Uh, many of the college campuses that I've been on, they, they uh, had, when they started, it, it all made sense in the way the buildings were numbered or laid out, but now as they've expanded and grown, there's new buildings that have been placed, and so the numbering doesn't make sense other than to the people who work there who even they had to figure it out. Um, so looking at that, how you say things, um, you know, we don't accept bills over $50 is very negative. Whereas if you just turn it around a little bit, we accept bills under $50 is more positive. Taking a look uh, through a walk, doing a walkthrough of your areas, uh, what, what is speaking? You know, this is a waiting room at, at a community college. You know, what are your magazines? Are they up to date? Are they magazines or material that students would be interested in reading while they're waiting are the signage and the uh, information that you got taped or tapped onto the walls. Is it updated and how does it look? I mean, does it look professional or is everything, you know, just uh, taped up for the moment? Uh, your dining areas, are they clean? Are uh, they cheerful uh, for the students or, or other visitors to be uh, in? that when you take a look at your hallways, here, you know, it's well lit, um, there's a railing for safety, um, information on the bulletin board, but it's truly just walking through and taking a critical eye through your different campus areas. Um, this actually was a, a picture from a timeshare unit uh, that I was visiting, and I took this picture at 9 in the morning, when I walked back by in the afternoon, it still looked like this at 2, uh, 2 p.m. Well, if you were a potential buyer of a timeshare unit at that location, what would be the subconscious message? Obviously not a lot of attention to detail. So I would recommend using a tool like this, very simple tool, to get a few of the uh, employees in your department, some that if you've got some newer ones, uh, and, and some of your older ones that have been around for a while and truly put on that critical eye that everything is speaking and what we see, hear, smell, and touch, what is enhancing the message we want to send out of our area and what do what is detracting. Then we have creating a wow in terms of the service delivery. And in the service delivery, I'm not talking about a wow here like a Nordstrom's where you buy a product and then you can use it and take it back and get a full refund, no questions asked. No, that's retail customer service wow. We're talking about academic service, academic wow. It's those little things that you do. It's remembering people's names. When people feel special, when they feel that you took the time to know their name, it's um, the um, listening to them, truly actively listening to them. It's walking me to a building. It's saying thank you when I pay my tuition bill. It's following up when you said you would do something for me, but following up to make it sh sure it got done. It's helping me get into the computer system. It doesn't mean that we are pandering or coddling students. It just means that we don't need to be putting more obstacles in their way. So it comes down to touch points. And this is a service map that looks at each touch point that you have in the processes that you do in your area. And then looking at each touch point and saying, is it mediocre the way we do uh, the interaction at this point of contact? Or how could we do it in an excellent way? And just looking at a very simple service map process here of a purchasing at a bookstore six opportunities to build a relationship with a student or a customer. Entering the bookstore, asking for the book to purchase, browsing through the shop. The way in line at the register, that's an opportunity to build a relationship. I've seen it at Costco where somebody comes up and down the line 
and they are starting to prepare uh, on a little calculator. So right when you first get up to the line on a very, very busy day, you're ready to go. Uh, I've seen some college campuses where they give water out in line on a long, hot day uh, when people are standing. Uh, paying the employee is an interaction and a touch point. Receiving your change and a receipt. So the key is to look at each one of these and say, how do we currently do it? Is it just mediocre, typical, 